I love the book of Acts, and we have been many weeks now in the book of Acts, and we left you with the end of chapter 14, the end of Paul's first missionary journey in Antioch of Syria. In Antioch of Syria, Paul comes back after his first missionary journey, and now what we're going to find in Acts chapter 15, and we're not going to cover the whole thing tonight, but we are going to go through uh, 35 verses. We're going to answer this question, and this was a, and such an important question, and this, what, is, what must a person do to be saved? I've got a little bit of a ring here, don't I? Is it just me? I do have, what do you call that when your ears ring? Tinnitus? When I was 13 years old. Listen, this, let this be a lesson to you. I was 13 years old, and I was up in Indiana, my uncle's place by the farm, and they had a black powder rifle. And I said, ah, oh, cool. They were shooting it, you know. It was the old, real, the real old kind, you know, like the musket. And I said, I'll shoot that thing. That didn't have any ear protection. And I went, boom. And I heard, I could hear nothing for a while. I don't know what I did to my eardrum, but just this, have you ever, and ever since then, <laughs> you know, how many years ago has that been? Um, 40 years ago. In my right ear, I just hear this constant ringing. So it's just like angel singing, I guess. But I can't tell sometimes if that ring, is that me or is that, that's in the room, I think. Uh, you know, throughout church history, church leaders on a few times have met at different parts of the world to settle important doctrinal issues. These are ecumenical meetings, meaning it's people from all different streams of Christianity. Occasionally this has happened in church history where people will gather together. So the second most famous ecumenical meeting ever, you prob you've probably heard about it, happened in AD 325, the Council of Nicaea. Should I go with a handheld because this thing is really ringing? Can I, can I uh, do the switch ears? <laughs> what a wise guy, huh? <laughs> I'm just teasing. Can I go handheld? Would that help? HH2, number two. Testing. Yes. That's better. All right, yeah, that's better. Okay. The second most famous ecumenical meeting was the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. It was convened, called to order by the Roman Emperor Constantine. And so they met to settle the issue of the nature of Christ. And out of that came the Nicene Creed. You probably have heard something about it, perhaps, in church history. But it was a big deal. Is Jesus Christ just a man or is he God? And so 318 scholars from different branches of Christendom came together under Constantine's direction, and they um, wrote the, these 20 points, the Nicene Creed, and affirmed that Jesus is, in fact, God, the Son of Almighty God. And so that was important. That's huge. Uh, but the first and the most important council of the church leaders the first one that ever happened was in Jerusalem, and that was recorded here in Acts chapter 15. So this council at J Jerusalem settles the most important doctrinal issue for us, and that is this. What must a person do to be saved? And what has brought this issue up is this, that the Gentiles are getting saved. And a bunch of Gentiles are getting saved. Remember, Paul has just come back from his first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. Acts 13 are called by the Holy Spirit, and they go to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, and then they go back through it with their follow-up and a bunch of new converts, and the Gentiles are coming to Jesus. Amen. And so the Jews are like, okay, the Gentiles are coming to Jesus, but you know what's going on? The guys are not being um, circumcised. Now, why is that so important? Because God chose Abraham and told him, 
in his adulthood. You need to get circumcised as a sign of the covenant that I'm making with you. It doesn't really address the issue of women here. Isn't that interesting? But circumcision, they didn't, uh, I guess, have the full light of the heart now. It's not just in the cutting away of the flesh. And so I, I remember seeing this cartoon one time. It's so funny. Here's Abraham. And he's hearing from God about the covenant of circumcision. And he looks up into heaven. He says, now, Lord, let me get this right. The Arabs get the oil, and we have to cut off the end of our what? <laughs> oh, I digress. I'm sorry. But what, what's happening is that um, this issue is being clouded. So do Gentiles, yes, by faith, have to receive Christ, but don't they have to keep the Mosaic law as well? Don't they have to keep our civil laws, our dietary laws, our moral laws? Isn't that prudent? Isn't that necessary? Um, and so what we see, the very first council, the very first meeting of the church, the broad church in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 15, is this, that they forever affirm this, that salvation is totally by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. If we did not have an Acts 15, if this council had not met, then maybe there would still be some things hanging on, I hope not after all these years of the Reformation, and, but some, some laws that we had to keep, it would be muddier. But they settled the issue here. They cleared it up. And so let's go ahead and examine the story of the council at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Acts 51. Now certain people, who are these certain people? These are the Judaizers. These are the false teachers who are self-appointed guardians of legalism. Teaching that salvation is by really by works. By keeping the works of the law. So these Judaizers come down from Judea. And where do they go to? Antioch. This is, remember, there's two Antiochs, Antioch and Syria, Antioch and Pisidia. Just to remind you, Antioch and Syria is where the church, after the persecution, of many of the leaders gathered. And this becomes the hub. This is where people were first called Christians. This becomes the hub of the wheel, sending out missionaries to the known world, to the Gentiles. This is where um, Paul starts and ends his missionary journeys. Except for his third missionary journey, he doesn't end it there, but it starts here. All the missionary journeys start out of Antioch at Syria. This is like the hub, right? The mother church. And so they come down, these Judaizers, to Judea and Antioch, and they're teaching these believers, listen, unless you're circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Now imagine you're a Gentile. You've just come to faith in Christ. You're, you have the Holy Spirit. Remember what happened at Cornelius' house while Peter is preaching. People are getting saved. They have the Holy Spirit. They're wonder and now people come and tell you, now, now, now listen, don't get all excited yet. Unless you get circumcised, unless you start following our laws, you can't really be saved. Which is the exact same as saying that salvation is by works. Remember we talked about that recently. So... Here's what happens now. So these Judaizers have come to Antioch, and, and verse 2, this brought up Paul and Barnabas into sharp, this brought them into a sharp dispute and debate with them. And so Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem from Antioch. Now they're going to go, well, actually, I think it's down, down to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. We're going to have our first meeting, ecumenical meeting of the leaders of the church post-resurrection. So the church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told their stories. Remember, there's no bus, there's no train, planes, automobiles. You're walking or you're on a donkey. And so it takes some, some time to get there. It takes a few days. So you stop in the towns and you start telling stories. And they're telling all these wonderful stories of what God did and Iconium and Lystra and Derby as they preached the gospel, and there was revival and there was riots. 
So they told how the Gentiles had been converted, and this made all the true believers ever very glad to know that the Gentiles are part of the church, part of Jesus' body. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church there, and the apostles and elders are here, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. And then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, it's always the Pharisees, isn't it? They stood up. And they said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Again, this is salvation by works. And they insist that these Gentiles, who are now are full of joy and full of the Holy Spirit, baptized, saved, they're saying, no, 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 not so fast. They must be required to keep the law of Moses. They must be required to be baptized according to these words. They must, be, they must take communion the way we take communion. They must sing the hymns that we sing. They must speak in tongues. They must, um, you name, they must be confirmed. They must be, you know, blessed. They must, you name it. We do the same thing today. We say it's salvation. Yes, it's by, it's by faith in Christ. Uh, but it's also, you got to add this onto it. And if you don't do this, then you're not really in. You're not really saved. I mean, you're, you might believe in God, you might love God or whatever, but until you take this step, until you do this or don't do this, stop doing this, stop playing cards, don't drink wine, don't overeat, don't go to the movies, don't go bowling, don't play cards. You know, you make up the rule. Don't cut your hair. Don't wear pants. Don't wear makeup. You, you make up the rule, whatever rule you want. You know, but it's, it's always salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, or it's Christ plus. And if you have to add a plus, then you've shifted from the true plan of salvation to a works mentality. It's grace plus nothing, right? It's Christ plus nothing. There's a, a, a formula, a math formula you should know. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Amen? Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so here we are, the apostles and elders. Here they are. They, they meet to consider this question. This is huge. Depending on how these early church leaders go, which direction they go, it's going to affect for the, really, for the rest of history, unless God intervened in some special way, it's going to affect people for the rest of history. Thank God they had wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And as this council meets, you're going to three, see uh, three different speakers. Actually, three different speeches. The second speech is Paul and Barnabas. But three different speakers get up and state their case. And the first one to get up and state his case is Peter. So, Peter is the apostle at this time with the most authority. He is the one who is called, you know, to the Jews. He's the one that Jesus said, um, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, right? He is the one that, on the foundation, you know, in that city, his name is on the Bible. It's Peter. This is the strongest disciple. He's the oldest one. I was listening to something today, a CD called The Dust of the Rabbi. And he was talking about how most of the disciples were probably teenagers, because rabbis, and this is very interesting, Randy gave me this um, Dust of the Rabbi CD, and I'm listening to it, and they said the, these rabbis could quote the entire Old Testament. And there was two kinds. There was the ones that taught the Torah, and then there, there was these rabbis that had the authority. Um, and there was very few of them, but they could quote the entire Old Testament. Can you imagine how smart they were? And so what would happen... And he, this guy was tell, saying, he said, listen, the thing that we notice today in the Western world is we have no real concept of discipleship. Here's what discipleship looked like in Jesus' day. People left everything, and they followed their rabbi everywhere. And he used an illustration. They'd go to the bathroom, and they are waiting in the bathroom for him because they might miss something. You know, they, they followed him everywhere, and the rabbi had to... Um, bless them. 
and, and say, come follow me, because not many made the cut. In order to make the cut, to be a follower of a rabbi, by the time you're 12 years old, you had to have memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And this guy was a Gentile who went to a Jewish school to learn, and he was the only one in his class, this is recent, who did not have the first five books of the, mem of the Bible memorized by heart. And he said, we have no concept of, you know, discipleship. We read a couple verses a week and think we're good. And he said, these people, they know the word of God. And so by the time, if they, if they memorize the first five books of the Bible, by the time they're bar mitzvahed, you know, 12, 13 now, they have another period where they have to learn the entire Old Testament. And if they pass that, by the time they're like 15, then they can approach a rabbi, and the rabbi may say, okay, you can follow me, and he'll test them. And when they followed him, they went everywhere with him. But it's very interesting how committed they were to the rabbis and how I, even when I was in Israel last year, you go to the house. Um, we went to a house for a Shabbat, and on the wall, they have pictures of the rabbis they follow. Just, you know, like we'd put a picture of the president or, you know, a little picture of Jesus. <laughs> we don't know what he looks like. We put it, but they literally still, even to this day, they put pictures of the rabbis on their wall. And they honor them. And they follow them. And Peter is the one who was chosen by the Lord to have the most authority, as we were saying here at this time. So his words are going to have weight. And after much discussion with this first council at Jerusalem, Peter gets up and he addresses them. And here's what he says. He said, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. And when did this happen? This happened, remember, he is at Simon the Tanner's house, the Mediterranean Sea, and he has a vision when he's up on the roof and he sees a sheet. He's hungry, waiting for dinner, and the sheet comes down. He sees all these animals rise, Peter kill and eat. No, it's unclean. Happens three times, it leaves. The Gentiles come to the door when it leaves. Don't call common what I say is clean. Go with them. And he goes to Cornelius' house. He's just preaching the gospel to Cornelius' house. This Roman centurion, this Gentile, and the Holy Spirit falls on them. They all get saved and baptized, right? You remember that? That's what he's referring to. He showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. Notice he did not discriminate between us and them. Why? They weren't, they weren't circumcised. They weren't following Jewish customs and the laws of Moses. But they were still cleansed. They were still given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit as proof. It's the earnest deposit proving that we belong to God. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts. How? By faith. You know what's interesting? Even Peter, who sets this up, the first speaker, who said, no, it's by faith alone. You don't have to follow those customs. Got rebuked by, and many of you know this, got rebuked by Paul in Galatians because when he would hang out with the Jews, he was worried about what they thought. So he said, okay, I know I'm really righteous because of faith in Christ alone, but because I'm with the Jews, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow their customs and kind of distance the Gentiles, because that was one of his weaknesses. He cared about what people thought about him. You remember that reading that in Galatians? Paul had to rebuke him because he was clearly in the wrong. But right here, he's in the right. And so he says this, now then, why, don't you, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? What's he saying? No one's been able to keep the law perfectly. And so why are you going to weigh them down with this? Remember, in Matthew chapter 23, the seven woes, Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites. You know, you have all the right words, but you're not living according to the law the way you should be. And you're making other people feel guilty because they're not holy like you are. Say you are, but you're really not. And No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as the Gentiles are. 
by grace. Your hearts are purified by faith, and it's by grace. You don't have to keep the works of the law. This is huge. This is huge. And so Peter gives one of the strongest defenses of salvation by grace through faith alone, in, right in Scripture, right here, in this speech in front of the council at Jerusalem. And so verse 12, and so now the whole assembly became silent after listening to him, and now the second speech. So you, when you're in a, a meeting, if you've ever been in a meeting like this where there's a big issue being discussed at your company or in your, you know, family or, you know, you've had some of those big meetings, Right? And whoever has the floor, you know, everyone listens intently and pays attention because you know the decision made in this meeting is going to affect your family or it's going to affect your business. And this is a big one. And next, Paul and Barnabas get up. They start telling about the signs and wonders. Eliamus, the sorcerer, goes blind. Remember? Just dramatic things. Paul gets stoned, left for dead. The believers gather around him. He rises up again and goes back and preaches again. And all the, the people coming to faith in Christ, all the Gentiles, the revival. I mean, they're just telling stories of healings and wonders of God. And God has done this among the Gentiles through their ministry. And so the leaders are listening. Now they've heard Peter, the apostle with the most authority. And now they hear Paul and Barnabas, and they know that they were called in Acts 13 by the Holy Spirit out of Antioch to go on this missionary journey, and they've, they hear about how God is moving in the Gentiles. So Peter has an experience with the Gentiles, Cornelius and his house, they received the Holy Spirit. There's obviously proof that the Gentiles here on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas have received the Holy Spirit. God has affirmed it. It's just, they're justified through faith. So now they're beginning to piece the things together. Okay, we, get, we see what's going on here. God is saving Gentiles, and they aren't keeping the law. Something's, something's going on. And now the third speech, and this kind of seals the deal. And the third person is James. Now, what's interesting about James, how many of this is not James and John, the fishermen, the brothers? Why is this not the sons of Zebedee? Because that James is dead. Remember, he got killed by Herod? Who is this James. This is Jesus' half-brother. What do you mean half-brother? Well, they have a common mother, Mother Mary. But who's his father? Joseph. Who's Jesus' father? God. So this is Jesus' half-brother. Who, by the way, did not believe in him uh, during Jesus' earthly ministry. Remember, he, they, they, he tried to tell people, listen, he's insane. Here's, here's a pretty good way you know you're the son of God. Your brother believes it. Because <laughs> he's seen you grow up. <laughs> After 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 7, where Paul is talking about the, all the eyewitnesses of the, the resurrected Christ, he mentions James there. And so James is a believer, the Lord's brother, and he's now looked at as like the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. So he is the one who's now going to have the final authority here. And, and when they finished, so we've heard Peter, his testimony to the Gentiles. Now we've heard Paul and Barnabas, the second speech at this council. And now here's the third one. And when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon, that Simon Peter, has described to us how God first intervened to, to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. And the words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. And now what he does is his, he takes his authority from the Scripture and he goes back to the prophet Amos. 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 However you want to pronounce it. And he goes back to Amos and he, he quotes the prophecy of the millennial kingdom to prove that Gentile salvation is not contrary to God's plan for Israel. And so he's quoting Amos here. After this, I will return and I will rebuild David's fallen tent, this millennial kingdom. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind, that's the Gentiles, may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known 
from long ago. So you have the, the heavy hitters talking to the apostles and the elders, pleading the case. It's your People's hearts are purified by faith. It's the grace of God. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we deserve. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to this through His miracles, through salvation for the Gentiles. It is by grace, through faith, in Christ, alone. That's how we're saved. And he goes on to conclude his case here in verse 19. He says this, It is my judgment, therefore, and I, I love this phrase in the NIV, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. That, if we take that very statement and the heart behind that statement and bring that today, 2,000 years later, into the modern church, I think that is not only powerful, but so helpful in people coming to Christ. Why? We should not make it hard. We try to make it hard. So, remember in churches, listen, if you don't come, if you come to this church, you know, you've got to dress a certain way. You've got to look a certain way. You've got to drive a certain car. You've got to get baptized a certain way. You have to, you know, live the way we tell you to live and follow the moral rules we tell you to follow. Or not, not just Scripture. We're, we've got our own specialty, you know. We're kind of doing it our way. And so if you want to fit in, you've got to do it this way. If you want to get baptized, you've got to take 12 weeks of class. So you know what you're doing. Well, is that what they did in the Scripture? If you want to take communion, you know, you have to take it this way. And if we're not careful, if you want to worship God, you have to have this type of music and this type of setting. And the sanctuary needs to feel like this and look like this. And, you know, we can get we can get crazy with stuff like that, with preferences that aren't scriptural mandates. <laughs> What's the deal? It's Jesus. It's having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and that comes by faith. And we should not make it difficult for people who need the Lord. Years ago, there was a, um, a pastor that I knew in southern Maine when we lived down there, and um, he came to church. He was, he was a drug dealer and um, living with his girlfriend. And, uh, you know, just a rough hombre. And he was in Colorado. He tells a story. And so he comes to church. Someone invites him one time, and he hears the gospel for the first time. And he's like, oh, it resonated with him. He believed it. And so he calls on Jesus, and he gets saved. Now he's still smoking pot, selling drugs, living with his girlfriend. And the people at the church didn't say to him, listen, you can't come back to church unless you clean up those things first. Now, did he need to clean up those things? Yes. But he's a babe in Christ. He's just, he didn't have everything figured out. He's not living a completely holy life yet. Now, on the one hand, he's made holy in Christ, but on the other hand, his life's a wreck. I wonder... Do any of us have any issues here tonight? Any secret sins we're battling? If we, if we right now could hook you up to the projectors and put all the slimy stuff in your life right now up here, would you crawl under the... <laughs> you know, come here. First, you've got to fix everything. He said, they just kept loving on me, preaching the word. And he said, pretty soon one day it dawned on me. You know, I don't think I should be selling drugs. It's illegal. I'm going to still smoke it, but I'm not going to sell it. And then one day, months later, the Lord dealt with him. You know what? I don't think I'm going to smoke drugs anymore. He prayed and God delivered him. And then one day it just occurred to him. You know what? I keep hearing the pastor say, you're not supposed to live in sexual sin. And we should probably get married. And they get married. And now, I'm not saying everybody has a journey like that. Sometimes God just zaps, zaps people. I mean, I've literally seen God. This guy came, and I told you the story not too long ago. He got instantly sober. Came to the altar, gave his life to Christ, instantly sober. 
It doesn't happen that way for everybody. And this guy became a pastor and lived for God the rest of his life, but it took him a little while. How many of you have been slow starters? <laughs> you do good for a little while, you fall off the wagon. But what do you do? Here's the thing. Here's, this, this is worth the price of admission tonight. You ready? If you fall off the wagon, don't run from God in shame. Run to Him in humility and repentance and honesty. Because He's merciful. He delights in showing mercy. We're all a work in progress. We should not make it hard for the Gentiles who are coming to faith. That's, they were thinking, you know, I remember hearing a story about the hippies. Remember the hippies? Some of you were hippies. Some of you still are hippies. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. There was a, you know, in the 70s, early 70s, there's, people would wear three-piece suits to church. Do they even make three-piece suits anymore? I remember in the 90s, I'm the only one in the church, me and one geeky guy wearing a suit. And I'm like, well, why am I doing this? I'm like, I've been in jeans ever since. But they were the three-piece suits, and, and uh, in those hippie days, one of the surfer dudes, you know, free love, free drugs, you know, coming out of that 60s era, uh, get saved. There was a revival in California, remember? Calvary Chapel was like a revival in California in the early 70s, and a bunch of these hippies were getting saved, and and Woodstock folks, you know, and, and um, this kid gets saved, gloriously saved. You heard about Jesus. His life's a wreck. He doesn't know, but he got saved. And so he said, oh, if I'm saved, I need to go to church. And he walks into one of these churches that's real stuffy. Everyone's in a three-piece suit. All the women have, you know, the real dignified look, you know. And here he is, long hair, bleached blonde. Cut off shorts. He walks in. He's just so happy to be in church. And people look at him like, oh, my word. Why would you let that in here? Get him out. He doesn't know any better. He's never been to church in his life. And he just, so he doesn't know where to sit, you know. So he just kind of comes down. And he sits, crosses his legs, Indian style, sits in the front, <laughs> right there. Not even in a chair. Just cross his legs, hearing the word of God. And you could hear a pin drop. Everyone's nervous. My wife says, Purvis is nervous. Purvis gets up from the back, the head usher, and he starts to walk down. And you can feel the tension in the room. Oh, this kid's going to get the boot. This older gentleman saunters down in his three-piece suit, gets right beside him, sits down, crosses his legs the best he can as his age and listens to the message with the kid, the surfer dude. Amen. <laughs> that's, I think that's the heart the Lord has for people. I'm not saying that holiness is not important. It is. I mean, we've talked about this many times, but the point is, especially newer believers, they need love, acceptance, mercy, just like we do. And we shouldn't make it Difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't add all these rules. They're just coming to faith in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. Let's help them. Let's encourage them. But, and this is very curious, these next couple of verses. But in addition to that, we need to teach them. Not only do we need to love them, but they need to learn to love their brothers too. And because they're coming out of idolatry, they're coming out of a pagan culture where sexual immorality is pregnant, uh, prevalent, prevalent. I mean, we've talked about, I mean, it's disgusting, some of the stuff like orgies and just filthy, vile stuff. They're coming out of that where they sacrifice things to idols and, you know, they, that is going to trouble their Jewish brothers and sisters big time. Why? Because they, they know the dietary laws, the moral laws. And so by 
The Gentiles, not considering their Jewish brothers, they're going to offend them. And if the Jewish brothers put too many regulations on the Gentile brothers and sisters, it's going to offend them. So they're trying to teach them this, what love looks like here. And so they say these things, and this is why I say it's curious. You'll see it in a moment, verse 20. Instead, we don't want to make it difficult. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols. Now, Paul said this before in Corinthians, it's not a big deal. If I have a steak, who cares, you know? But I don't care if it's dedicated to some God that doesn't exist. But if my brother's here and he's going to be offended by that, I'm not going to do that. Right? Now, <laughs> tell him to abstain from that and from sexual immorality. Now, this, this goes beyond just a, um, a simple civil law. This is like moral law. That's always the top of the list, right? Among the church, there should, there's two sins that we should never name in the church. You know what they are? Sexual immorality and greed. And what do we struggle with more than anything else? Sexual immorality and greed. But these two sins should not once be named among the people of God. And so, you know, don't engage in orgies and sexual immorality and fornication and adultery. Don't do that. Um... And from meat of strangled animals. Again, that goes in with these dietary restrictions. You've read the book of Leviticus. You see all these things. And from blood. Why, the life is in the blood. Don't, you know, don't eat blood sausage. Don't be sucking down blood martinis or <laughs> literal blood. I mean, don't be a vampire. That's going to offend your Jewish brothers. I came across a, a quote ex explaining this pretty well from uh, the MacArthur Bible Commentary, it said this. Let's go ahead to the next slide, if you would. James and the other leaders in Jerusalem did not want the Gentiles to revel in their freedom in Christ, which could cause the Jewish believers to follow that same liberty and violate their consciences. This is what love does. So James proposed that the Gentiles abstain from four pagan idolatrous practices that were violations of the law of Moses so as not to offend the Jews. So there you have it. And so what do they do? Well, the council sits down now, and they're going to write a letter to the church at Antioch, to the Gentiles. To in their letter, Acts 15, 22, and 29. And then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Why? They had no phones. They had no way to corroborate the message. Maybe this is just Paul and Barnabas saying this or writing this. No, we're going to send some witnesses, some prophets, some eyewitnesses to go to corroborate this story, this message. So they chose um, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. And here's the letter. Here's the conclusion of the first council, the first council that answers this question, you know, about salvation. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authoriza authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. And what were they saying? Get circumcised, follow the law, Mosaic law, or you're not saved. And so we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we're writing, what I just told you. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. Farewell. That is the best they got right there. In other words, salvation is by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And these other things, if you'll do these things, you're showing love to your brothers and sisters. That's a good thing. But there's no laws. There's no works to be added to the work of the cross for salvation. Aren't you glad? So in the letter, they affirm 
that they don't want to burden the Gentiles with unnecessary rituals, with unnecessary laws, but they do reiterate these four things they decided upon. And so now we'll conclude with this. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter, and the people read it and were glad for the encouraging message. And Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. And after spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So what's going to happen? Is the Gentiles are going to be set free. They're going to learn to respect their, the Jewish believers as well. But the, the question at this first council has been answered, what must a person do to be saved? And that is have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Plus nothing. And all these other, these other works are good. We talked about, uh, actually Sunday, about good works prepared in advance for us to do. We should do that. We do need to live holy lives, but that's not what saves us. For by grace have you been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So the question is, is your faith in Christ? Have you repented of your sins? Have you acknowledged your need of a Savior? Have you owned it, owned your sin? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus and called on his name? Let me pray with you right now and give you an opportunity to do that. Those of you joining us online as well, let's pray this from your heart to the Lord. Dear God in heaven, I thank you that salvation comes by your grace and not by my works. I thank you that salvation comes to us who believe because of what Jesus has done on the cross by paying for our sins. Lord, I acknowledge my sin before you and I ask for your forgiveness and your mercy. I put my trust completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you put your Holy Spirit in me, that you forgive all my sins, that you help me to live for you, to live a holy, godly life that will please you and that shows love to my brothers and sisters. Lord, teach me your ways and your will in Jesus' name. I pray, amen.